And because of that, we have what is known as a song book. When we look at the book of Psalms, that's exactly what it is. It's a Jewish song book. And it's the largest book in the Bible, and I'm not going to reiterate everything over and over again. I just know we've been gone from, away from the subject for two weeks, so we're just getting back to it real quick. Um, and how many divisions are there in the book of Psalms? There's 150 chapters, but how many different divisions? Remember, we talked about the book of Psalms being divided into so many divisions. Not three. Not four. I need one more. I hear five. Five. And what do these five divisions correspond with? Like we, remember, we talked about book one, book two, book three, book four, book five. Not different ones that wrote it. They correspond with something very specific. What is the book that states, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth? Genesis. So book one corresponds with Genesis, which means book two corresponds to what other book? Genesis, Exodus, book three would be Leviticus, then Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They correspond with the five books of Moses that we know as the Pentateuch. We know many different people wrote the book of Psalms. We know when we refer to the book of Psalms, we say Psalms, the book of Psalms, or if we're referring to uh, chapter 23 and 24, we would say Psalms 23 and 24, but if we are only referring to one psalm, it is no S, it's just psalm, because psalms means songs, or psalm. So if there's more than one, we add an S. If there's just one, we have just psalm. Now with that being said, when we go through life, there are different things that we might do to convey feelings and emotions. Sometimes when maybe we're dating somebody or corresponding with them and we want to impress them, maybe Brother Eli has a girlfriend in a far off state, so I impress her, he will tell her how beautiful she is and how lovely she is, but he'll do it in an artistic fashion. So he might go something like roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. When we go through, when we look at the Christian life in general, people express themselves artistically through poems or poetry. When we look at the book of Psalms, it's really no different. Now, I just hope that Brother Eli does not correspond the rest of that poem where it goes, roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. But the roses are loaded, and the violets are dead, and the sugar bowl is empty, and so is your head. I mean, that would get him in major trouble. But, <laughs> but poetry is a form or expression of feelings and emotions. We've all gone through schooling, and at some point in our schooling, they've taught us poetry. They taught us how to understand poetry, how to write some poetry. They taught us famous poets like Emily Dickinson, or maybe uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and so on and so on. When we look at a song, it is composed of music, but it's also composed of lyrics. There are many times that people have taken poems in the past and put music to them, and it becomes a song. When we look at the Bible, there is poetry throughout the entire Word of God. When we look at Hebrew poetry, it is different than poetry as we know of it in the Western world. In fact, up to roughly 200 years ago, Hebrew poetry was completely lost. Then in 1753, the first book was published on Hebrew poetry and how to understand it by Robert Loeb. Now he did a 
Latin transcription um, title, but it is translated on the sacred poetry of the Hebrews. That was the title of his book. When we study the Bible, one third of the entire Old Testament contains poetry. When you think about that, that's not something that comes to mind when we sit down and study the Bible or when we're listening to a sermon, that one third of the Old Testament contains poetry. Every book of the Old Testament, except for six, contain poetry. Those six are Leviticus, Ruth, 2 Kings, Nehemiah, Esther, and Haggai. There are three distinct kinds of Hebrew poetry. There is the dramatic kind that can be found in the book of Job and the Song of Solomon. There's the lyrical kind, like in the book of Psalms, where you have music placed to it. And then you have didactic and sentious in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, like I said, when it comes to Hebrew poetry, it's different than English poetry. The largest difference between the two types of poetry lies in the use of rhyme and the meter, or the rhythm. The rhythm of Hebrew poetry is based upon thought arrangement. When we look at English poetry, it is based upon uh, word arrangement. So when it comes to the Hebrews, they base their poetry and the way they break it up and the meter and the rhythm is all based on the um, thought aspect of it, the feelings, whereas we base it upon, okay, this word is here, we go every so many syllables, and this is where the end of the um, line of poetry should end. Also, the meter, or the rhythm, oh, rhythm of Hebrew poetry is based up, not upon the accent, is based upon the accents of, the, of their thought, but not the syllables. Like I said, we'll go so many syllables and say there should be six syllables in this line that correspond with the previous line, or maybe this line is parallel with two lines up, and they need to mirror each other with so many syllables to make it come out perfectly. Now, we're going to do some reading here just to bring it to our attention, and we are going to read Hebrew poetry this morning. Now, the very first uh, form of poetry that we find in any book of the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 4, 23 through 24. If someone would please read Genesis 4, 23 through 24. Now, we're just giving some uh, examples here, and we'll talk about different not, uh, styles later, but there's poetry scattered throughout the entire Old Testament of the Bible. If someone has Genesis chapter 4, 23 through 24. And if you don't have it in your Bible, it's right there at the top of the first page. Genealogies, and right here in the middle, we have Lamech's poem, 
which is referred to as the Song of Lament. Now, if we would go to, well, we won't read the next one for the length, or the next two, but if we would turn, and we're not going to, but Genesis 49, verses 2 through 27, in there we have the poem, or the poetry, referred to as the blessing of Jacob. In Exodus chapter 15, 1 through 21, we have the victory songs of Moses and Mary. Now, if somebody would please find Numbers chapter three, uh, 23, 7 through 10. Genesis, oh, not Genesis. Numbers 23, 7 through 10, and then all three, 18 through 24. Numbers 23, 7 through 10. And then read also those verses 18 through 24. He took up his parables and made the king of Moab that brought me forth from Aaron out of the mountain of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come to fight Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord has not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him, and those people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned. Like I said, just 7 through 10 and 18 through 24. Okay. And he rose up, and he took up his parable and said, Right, the bailiff, and here, hearken unto me, thou son of the girl, and God is not a man that he should lie. He is the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said that, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I received the man with the glass, and he hath blessed, and I cannot be cursed. He hath not beheld the iniquity, and Jacob neither hath he seen. Lord maketh fall poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. 
He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifts up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord, and he has set the world apart upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength that shall no man prevail, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces, and of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his salvation. That is referred to as the prayer of Hannah. As we've already said, one third of the entire Old Testament is poetry. And we've already read some poetry this morning. Now we're going to go a little bit farther and we're going to talk about different kinds of Hebrew poetry. Like I said earlier, it was lost up to about roughly 200 years ago until the first book on Hebrew uh, poetry was published. One of the very first kinds of poetry we're going to look at is referred to as synonymous parallelism. Would someone find Psalm 24, 1 through 3? We see the first line is the law of the Lord is perfect, 
I'm going to skip the next line. But then we see the testimony of the Lord is short. It's the exact same thing. The testimony of the Lord is the exact same thing as the law of the Lord. And the word right is the exact same thing. I mean the same thing. Short, the word short, is the exact same word that describes perfect. I mean there is no difference in meaning. We can go down and skip the next line and see the statutes of the Lord are right. Statutes are the exact same thing as the testimony and the law of the Lord. It says that his statutes are right. The word right is the same thing as sure, perfect. But if we go down to the next lines, we see that they line up as well. And they add meaning to the first thing. So we see the law of the Lord is perfect. And what does it do? It's converting the soul. The converting the soul. And then we go back to the testimony of the Lord is sure, repetition of that first line. And then we have further explanation, making wise simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, giving a little bit more emphasis or uh, uh, examples to that first line, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord are pure. And then we have an add, something else that is added to all those other lines to adding more meaning. And, and what does it do? It enlightens the eye. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and are righteous together. Really, we can take that first line, the law of the Lord is perfect, and if you skip down to every second line, we have an explanation or um, we have something that adds to that line. And the reason I say that is if we take the line of the, the Lord is perfect, and go down to every line that's parallel with them, it says exactly the same thing. It's describing exactly the same thing. It's that second line that adds emphasis, that gives us a clear understanding to exactly what it is. Then we find that we have introverted parallelism, where members are placed in inverse or backwards order. We find that in Psalm Psalm chapter 5 and verse 7. Would someone like to read Psalm 5, 7? But why don't we all turn there regardless? Psalm 5, 7. So really, we could go in this fashion. In the multitude of thy mercy and in thy fear, Will I come into thy house? But this form of poetry actually puts it in inverse or backwards order. As for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy and in thy fear. And then we have that last line that goes along with the first one. Will I worship toward thy holy temple? Or we can have it this way if we would turn to... Okay, if you want to turn to Matthew 13, 15, this is another example of inverted parallelism. I'll go ahead and read this one, Matthew 13, 15, where the Bible states, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have closed, Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and with and hear with their ears and should understand their heart and they should be converted and I should heal them. If we look at the three main words here, we're looking at hearing, we're looking at sight with the eyes, and we're looking at the heart. If we go down in order and we break it down, the first thing it mentions is talk is talk about the heart. It does a line talking about the ears. It does a line talking about the eyes. Then after you finish the rest of that poem, it goes in an inverse order. So we start off with the heart, ears, and eyes, and then it talks about the eyes 
years and hard. So it flips it. Did everyone see that? So inverted parallelism is when they talk about something and then they reverse it. Then we have alternate parallelism, whereas the members follow one another in turn or back and first and back and forth. The first line being parallel to the third and the second to the fourth. So you'll have a line, another line, and that first line is a copy of what comes in the third line. An example of this is found in Psalm chapter 103, verses 11 and 2. Psalm 103, 11 and 2. So why don't we all turn there? Psalm 103 and 11 and 2. God, 
gives us better understanding into the writing of the Bible. I was reading one commentary where he stated that when it, we study Hebrew poetry, it reveals to us that when it comes to the Word of God and when they were writing, that the Hebrews were very emotional about what they were reading, and it was almost for an open setting. And all I can say is, duh. No, duh. That should have been common sense. Because what would happen when we would look at the Song of Sense as we study out later? These weren't things that the Hebrews read, but rather these were things that they recited and they said as a group as they were journeying to the temple. I think it's the book of Deuteronomy. If we go back, you have um, the Israelites on one side of one mountain and the others across the valley on another mountain. And what are they doing? They, if I remember correctly, they are reading the word, of the law of the Lord. But what they would do is they would do it in responsary fashion. One person, one group would read something real loud and it would echo across the valley. And then the second group would read the second portion and come across the valley. If we would study out the book of Esther, that book was meant to be read at a particular time during their uh, one of their feasts. And you re I'm trying to remember how it would go. I think if it was correctly, everybody would be sitting as the book would be read. And any time that Mordecai's uh, Mordecai's name would be mentioned. Everybody would stop their feet real loud every time it was mentioned. And because it was read in a group's fashion, that's what the way it was meant to be. And everybody would stop their feet on the floor. And every time that they mentioned Haman's name, everybody would hiss. What is it? The Jews were very emotionally involved in their writings. Even today, if we look at the Jewish people, um, they're very, a very emotional people. What happened when they were sad and distraught? If we would look at people in today's fashion, um, or in Western society, if we're hurt, we're not going to let anybody else see it. If we're sad, maybe we'd go into our side closet and cry. No one else is going to see us. But what did the Jews do when they were upset? They would uh, rent their clothes. They would put ashes on their head. They would throw the dust in the air. They were very emotional people. That's why I said, duh, earlier, because when they wrote their books, they were very emotional about it. Therefore, we get that portrayed through their literature, through their poetry. Was it meant for open settings? I'm sure it was. It was meant for people to be read aloud. Responsory poetry, probably when they read it in some homes, when they read the Word of God, or even maybe even in the temple, or the uh, synagogue. Perhaps the priest would... Um, read one portion of it, and the congregation would read, um, recite back the second portion of it. So when we look at Hebrew, uh, when we study the Word of God, it shouldn't surprise us that it was wrote, written with emotion, it was written in poetic fashion, and it was meant to stir other people's emotions as well. And when we are studying the book of Psalms, it should really be no surprise to us. And if somebody has told us that the poems and the poetry of the book of Psalms would lend to story emotions, we should all be able to stand back and say, well, duh, it's a psalm book. When we look at the psalm book that we say, these psalms are meant to story emotions. They're written out of emotions. And the book of Psalms is no different. It is Hebrew poetry. It was written out of emotion. It stirs our emotion. And not only that, but it talks about life experience, emotions people are experiencing, situations that they're going through. And as we mentioned, I think it was the last time together, the book of Psalms is the only book of the Bible that is written opposite of all the other ones. And what I mean by that is when we look at the Word of God, when we look at James, when we look at 1 Samuel, when we look at Genesis, those are all books of the Bible where we see that God is writing down and talking to man. But the book of Psalms is the only book where a man is writing in regards and he's writing to talk to God.
Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add at this point in time? If not, let us bow our heads and we'll prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will continue to do. Lord, we thank you for that your God who reigns on high and there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, Lord, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way, Lord. We pray that you set your angels to the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and minds will be in one mindset, and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as it so desires, make himself visible as it so chooses. Anoint the song leaders and the musicians, Lord, as they praise you upon the string instruments, upon the vocal force, Lord, as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he uh, preaches today, Lord. Let your words flow forth, Lord. And let our hearts and our minds be found that they be consoled for your word to all Lord today, Lord, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives. And we may be even farther transformed into your very image, Lord. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.